the actor. Jonathan Majors, uh, we're continuing with this uh, as well. Uh, and so remember, for these latest developments, we've been relying uh, on legal affairs journalist and expert Megan Cuniff. Megan's going to join us right now. Uh, the jury deliberating in Majors' domestic abuse trial, the return Monday. Maybe we'll see a verdict on Monday. Uh, well, let's bring Megan into the conversation here with some of these updates. Megan, good to see you. Okay, first up with Jonathan Majors uh, and this domestic abuse trial uh, here. My question is, um, kind of before we get into it, I guess, maybe walk us back. What is Majors being accused of? He is accused of assaulting his now ex-girlfriend uh, inside and then outside a cab in Washington, D.C. He's charged with four, uh, or not Washington, D.C., excuse me, New York City. He's charged with four counts, uh, four misdemeanor counts. Three are related to what allegedly happened in the car, and then one is related to what allegedly happened outside the car. And outside the car, we have the benefit of a surveillance video, a, a grainy surveillance video, but it shows uh, him him putting her back in the car in a way that's, of course, described differently by the prosecution and defense. So these are, are misdemeanor charges that carry up to a year in jail. But what's really at stake for him here is his career, which we're seeing right now. He was really on a, a, a rise and on a huge uh, level in Hollywood that's under threat right now if he gets convicted on this. It's not overly likely that if for some reason, he is convicted on this. He would go to jail, but he would get probation and he would ha hanging have this hanging over his head, which could really affect roles, which we, we've already seen uh, problems for him in his business since these charges came up. I guess that was my next question, Megan. You know, has he been dropped from any projects? Is he still with his agency? Uh, what is the kind of um, career reparations he's seen so far just from this? He's definitely seen things pretty much uh, frozen. His oh. a, a PR company that he was working for or working with at the time uh, ditched him. But he's obviously still working with some people right now to try to salvage his career. And of course, they're they're hoping for a not guilty verdict. And they've got a lot of he's got a lot of supporters online. I saw something. Uh, someone posted a video of him leaving today, and you can hear a supporter yell uh, yell some support for him that he's going to beat. Them. This. And he has his a new girlfriend, uh, Megan Good, who's been in court with him every day. I guess her, her mother's been there, too. And uh, today or yesterday during closing arguments was a really emotional day. Uh, and they were uh, crying in court. And apparently so was his defense lawyer when she was giving her closing argument, which I talked to one uh, reporter who was there who said, you know, just factually speaking, it's not her opinion. But she'd never seen that before. before. And she's covered quite a few high profile trials, but she thought it was it seemed like genuine emotion from the defense attorney as she was crying. But of course, I think the prosecutors were putting on a, a, a lot of emotion too and saying that, you know, this is about an abusive relationship, that this was a long-term abusive relationship that Grace Jabari, who's the, the British um, model, the now ex-girlfriend, who's the, the alleged victim in this case, that she'd been really endured a lot over the two years. Yeah, of course, and uh, I don't know if this needs to be said, but in some of that file footage uh, of Jonathan Majors, he's walking there with his now current girlfriend, uh, Megan Good there. Uh, and to your point, yes. Grace Jabari uh, had brought these allegations, uh, his ex-girlfriend as well. So now uh, the case is in the hands of the jury, Megan. Um, they've been deliberating, from what I understand, for two days without a decision. So they'll return yeah. Monday to the courtroom in New York City. Do you think we'll get a verdict then? Uh, should I characterize this as taking so long or no? Do they have a lot to go through? I think they have a lot to go through, okay. and then also the hours that they've been working. They deliberated uh, Wednesday afternoon after closing arguments, but I think it was only for a, a couple hours at, at the most. And then uh, today they actually had an afternoon deliberation where they didn't uh, go into the deliberation room until actually about 2.15 Manhattan time, and they were out uh, by close of business time. So I think the 10 a.m. return to court uh, really will count Monday as their first full day of deliberation, although they already have, you know, four hours or so, perhaps five, six hours under their belt. And they've asked a question already that's pretty fundamental. They asked for a judge's description of the charges, and then they wanted to re-watch uh, re a, a portion of the footage that we're watching now that I was able to meet, uh, obtain from them. Yeah, Megan, what are we watching now? 
Uh, this is uh, uh, when police are arriving. He has called, Jonathan Majors has called 911 and said that um, he, he thinks his, uh, there there might have been a suicide attempt and she's in the, the, the closet. And police are arriving and talking to him. And, and the district attorney's office's evidence had put this all together as one footage. So uh, later in the, in, in the uh, tape, we do, and there's other footage of... Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, of the car uh, incident where he's uh, pushing her uh, into the car and in, in a way that's characterized by the defense is, is simply just putting her back in the car, but the prosecution characterizes it elsewise. But this is him talking to the police who have arrived at his uh, condo in Manhattan and are responding to this 911 call that we also now have the benefit of being able to to hear ourselves. So this is just shows that obviously something was in disarray that night and it's just a question of uh of, of how is the jury going to take this aftermath of what happened in the car what does this say about what happened and how has the jury been interpreting this including this photo here what, what are we looking at here just more of the apartment in disarray yes right? yeah this is th th this is disarray this is what they found uh the police found when they when they arrived and this looks like you know something from the night before that they're asking jonathan majors about and that uh, jurors were able to hear a testimony about this in person and and, and i've when, when i've been looking at the testimony and i know i talked about this in a, a previous appearance that obviously her testimony grace jabari's testimony was so critical to this but there was a driver who obviously was driving the car when they were in the back seat and this was going on and he was a test uh, a witness for the prosecution but uh, from my reading and the reporting that I've heard to and the reporters I've talked to have said that it really seemed to go the defense's way, that he was speaking through a language interpreter. So there's always that barrier. But it, some people argue that it seemed like perhaps that is what kept the prosecution from fully understanding what he was going to say when he got on the stand. Because the reporting I've seen is that he said he thought that she was she was instigating it, oh. that she was she was starting it and and really being aggressive with him and he did say that he kept his eyes ahead on the road that he didn't actually see what was going on but that his belief was that she was causing some kind of assault just from the way she was acting but i've heard other people say that perhaps that got lost in translation oh. and i i think it's just a a benefit that that the jurors have of actually being in the courtroom because yeah. they can hear all this and see that themselves but just from what everything i've seen it seems like they have a, a a tough case and there's so much focus on what happened before and what happened after because one thing that came in and that was kind of a procedural uh, blunder by by, uh, Jonathan Major's attorney was she opened the door as they say legally for a piece of evidence that otherwise wouldn't have been allowed in was allowed in and it was a, a phone call or a, a recording that Grace had made of Jonathan Majors talking to her a couple months ago uh, in a previous incident. So some people have said that, you know, depending on how you interpret the phone call, it's an example of being in an abusive relationship. But other people have said that there's just so much evidence in this case that isn't about the actual incident. We see the aftermath, we see the police arrival afterward, but, you know, we don't have the benefit of a camera within the car to see what exactly was going on. So yeah, yeah, Megan, I, I think Megan. I think there's a possibility of a hung jury, but we're going to know oh. a lot more on Monday because there, there's always the possibility of a hung jury sure. and, and juries can surprise, surprise you. And one thing you never really want to do is predict too much what they're going to do. No, that is that is so true. Remind us just briefly, when did this incident occur? You know, this was back in, uh, I, I think, March. Uh, oh, this year. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was it was a pretty fast time coming for the for the trial. There okay. were a few delays. But with it being uh, a misdemeanor case, I think it's possible for them to get in a little bit faster. But yeah, this, this just uh, was part of 2023, or earlier in the spring. Megan, I, I, to, to me, just from the outside in looking at this, uh, I'm struck by the amount of photographic and video evidence, you know, before and after you have the body camera footage from NYPD officers who responded to this uh, that we were showing as well. And correct me if I'm wrong here, because you cover a lot of these cases, but especially when um, the allegation of domestic abuse is levied uh, on whoever, it doesn't seem like there's much photographic or video evidence to rely on when it gets to trial. That's not the case here. Is, is this somewhat yeah, peculiar yeah. For, for an allegation like this? 
I do. I think it's remarkable that there oh. there is a lot of this just both from police body camera and then from surveillance footage just from around New York City kind of speaks to the location that this all happened in. And then just the the fact that the court is willing to have it released during trial like this, I, I, I think is remarkable. And then uh, and then re regarding when this happened, I, I did confirm it was March 25th. Uh, 2023. So this is still uh, within a nine month period that we're having a jury trial and having, you know, all this information uh, out at out about it at once, I think is is remarkable. But there's also the the 911 call. Uh, it's about a four minute call that I listened to earlier where he uh, calls, actually summons the police there. So it's the opportunity for the jury to hear his demeanor and hear how he is. But, you know, again, they they don't have the benefit of a, of a bird's eye view of, of what happened. They, you know, the driver, like e even the driver who would be the one eyewitness, it sounds like he says he didn't see anything, but he heard a lot of things that he was able to testify to that again uh looks like it favors jonathan majors and and the argument that she is the one who started it and is making this up so i i just think the the how far apart the prosecution and defense are is is remarkable um you know it's not a it's definitely not a prove it defense or they didn't prove their case well well i'm sure they're saying that the defense is also just point blank saying she's lying that this is a conspiracy basically and oh, wow. they've they brought in race and brought up the fact that you know jonathan majors is a black man and, and grace jabari is a, a white woman and that this is a malicious prosecution here yeah um just lastly on the jonathan majors front here as well you you said his career is kind of frozen in place right now uh and he had such a you know really illustrious career before all of this um can he rebound from this at all or is he indefinitely marked depend no matter how the jury decides i, I think if he gets an acquittal definitely if there's a not <clears throat> guilt, guilty i think a lot of people would see that as as vindication and he would he definitely would have the possibility of, of perhaps even getting back to where he was before. I think a conviction would be detrimental, but a hung jury, he could also, uh, he, he's not done after a hung jury either. I think if there is a hung jury, it's likely that the Manhattan District Attorney's Office would retry, retry him, but he would still be able to kind of hang on like he is now. But I think his team is really hoping for a not guilty verdict and that they can present as, as vindication to the public. So Megan, um, we were trying to get this video. We have this video now. We wanted to show it's really um, some of the most compelling and or damning uh, of the entire evidence that is being presented here. What are we looking at? Uh, this is also from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Um, and, and you can kind of make out the couple in the elevator. They're in the apartment lobby. They're on the street corner. Quite extensive. What are we watching? Yeah, this is more surveillance footage of uh, turning and you know i'll have to go through and really uh dig it all out because this is them all all night this is them before and then this is them after this is the 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 car right here where we'll we'll actually see them uh get out and we'll see what the the prosecutors allege is one of the assaults the the, the push right there where he puts her back in the car but then what his team really focuses on is how aggressive she is here and how uh you can see her uh, you can see her kind of go after him and you know they focus on the fact that he's trying to get away and she's going after him and then we see more footage of her running after him after this so the as the manhattan district attorney's office did they zoomed in on this to really show because they say they presented that as one of his first degree or excuse me one of his misdemeanor assault charges this was after the the other three charges that they say happened in the in the car but uh, what his team says is that he was simply just putting her back in the car that it wasn't as as aggressive as the prosecutors try to make it out to be so but obviously when we see that it's the the district attorney's office is the one that considers this their evidence but the, the defense sees a lot that they can work with here too the the aggressiveness afterward they feel supports their theory that that uh, grace jabari was the instigator here oh. but other people have said that you know it's an example of a domestic violence victim you know finally fighting back but then of course there's the activity after this where she went out uh to a club with uh somebody who did testify and then he went home 
and he, he he never testified and but that was established through other means in trial so i think the jury just has a lot to look at in terms of not only that video but then what happened afterward to try to kind of assess demeanor and intent and that kind of thing yeah uh, megan while we have you we're making you work tonight on this friday but we wanted to get an update too because um, this is the story that really put you on the map and, and kind of highlighted all of your reportage as well. We're talking about um, Tory Lane's case, uh, of course, and that's how kind of you and I uh, kind of got acquainted as well. And you have done such extensive reporting. We know he's serving that 10 year sentence um, for shooting at Megan the Stallion. Uh, and he has now gone into custody. He's serving his sentence right now. Um, it seems like um, the appellate process is moving along quite rapidly here. If briefly you could offer an update on the Lane's case. It, it, it is moving uh, pretty quickly. He has a new filing in. It was just uh, yesterday. It's a, a habeas petition, which is something that uh, convicted criminal defendants can do even years after their sentence, if they're well into a prison sentence. And they think that there's new evidence that supports their innocence, that uh, supports resentencing, supports a new trial. And they can argue that they deserve further proceedings based on that. And he's done that based on a statement from his driver who was actually there the night, uh, the the early morning that Megan was shot in the feet. She, she had several bullet fragments in her feet that were removed by uh, surgeons. But uh, Lane's had a bodyguard and driver who was driving the Escalade that night. And that was one person that we did not hear from in the trial. We never heard from a guy who clearly would have been an eyewitness to this. And it, it seemed like he would have been an eyewitness to this, but he actually showed up at the courthouse and uh, Lanes wanted to call him as a defense witness during trial, but prosecutors had not talked to him at all or had any kind of benefit of any kind of pre-talk or, or, or deposition or, so, or something along that lines. So they wanted uh, time to do that, which would have risked delaying the trial. So Lanes and his attorney made the decision not to call the driver as a witness because they didn't want to risk a mistrial or delaying the trial. It was right around the holiday time last year when this was happening. So he never testified, but now he's come forward and said, while he doesn't know who fired shots, he didn't see shots, he did see an argument between Megan and her friend Kelsey Harris, who was the other witness to this, oh, and God. who Lanes has always blamed for the shooting, at least in the trial he blamed for the I shooting. Think. The driver has come forward and said that, yes, I saw Kelsey with a gun in her hand, and there was a struggle over it and that Lane's got out to, to get the gun out of her hands. It's a question of uh, whether this is too little too late because oh. he, he point blank says that he didn't see who fired shots. And his testimony is really similar to, or his, his affidavit is really similar to the testimony of a homeowner who actually testified and uh, pretty clearly said that he saw the flashes. He thought, thought they were flashes and uh, fireworks and heard fireworks, but he later realized they were muzzle flashes from a gun. He testified that he thought they began with, he said the girl, one of the girls, that the girls were fighting, but then he went on to testify that the shorter guy, uh, the smallest individual who would have been Lanes, got out of the car and uh, was releasing a, a torrent of abuse and that there were he was firing everywhere. Wow. And they even asked, the prosecutor said, how many shots do you think the, uh, how many shots did you see the short guy shoot when you said he was firing everywhere? And the homeowner kind of paused and answered uh, four or five. So while he, he put the gun in Kelsey's hand in the very beginning, he went on to clearly implicate Lanes as the shooter. Okay. And of course there's a jury sitting there hearing all of this and they've heard, they'd heard all the other testimony and, and the benefit of that. And they came back and convicted him. It'll be uh, a year ago uh, next week that oh, wow. he was convicted. But of course his uh, attorney, now are arguing that the jury didn't have the benefit of hearing from this uh, this eyewitness, uh, uh, the driver, Juan, Juan Smith, who could have uh, further corroborated that they were fighting. Although he, he does say in his affidavit, he didn't see who fired shots, which okay. I think would definitely be a point for prosecutors to explore on cross-examination because it's, I mean, it's almost hard to believe that you would be right there and see this all go down, but not see who fired shots. Sure. And then right after it happened, not be able to discern who fired shots. Yeah, but, of course. Uh, yeah, all of this uh, will be so interesting of how, you know, the prosecution and the defense will use it in the appellate process too. Uh, everything kind of that you just elucidated there. There's a lot to go on. Uh, and so as always, yeah. um, Megan Kudoff, we do appreciate your reporting. Thanks so much for bringing it to us and our viewers here Thank on you. Live Now. Have a good weekend.
Thank you. You too.